stole, someone stole O'Banion's pig. Blame it on the Kellys. Pat McCarver's horse and rig. Blame it on the Kellys. And someone robbed the Sydney mail. Sacked the jail of their jail. If the tater crop should fail, they'll blame it on the Kellys. Blame it on the Kellys, boys. Blame it on the Kellys. Shame, shame upon their name. Blame it on the Kellys. Ned Kelly is a 1970 film by Tony Richardson from a screenplay by Ian Jones, starring Mick Jagger as Australia's most famous outlaw. The film began life as Ian Jones' passion project. Jones had an extensive career in television and film, and is known as the foremost authority on the Kelly outbreak in Australia. His first draft was picked up by Woodfall Film Productions, and passed on to Tony Richardson, who was known for directing theatre at the time, who tinkered with the script until it was something he was happy to film. This included some of the structure of the screenplay and incorporating more songs. Richardson's choice for casting the titular Bushranger remains controversial. In early pre-production, the role was to have been filled by Shakespearean actor Ian McKellen, a choice Jones approved of at the time. Richardson, however, felt the role should be played by someone edgier and more rebellious, and looked to the rock and roll scene. Here, he discovered his perfect bad boy in Rolling Stones frontman Mick Jagger. Jagger grew a beard for the part, but inexplicably no moustache, yet he still doesn't present the correct image to stand in for Ned Kelly. Ned was a sinewy 20-something that stood around 6 feet tall, whereas Jagger was, and to some extent still is, wiry, pouty, and stands around 5'7". An example of the physical shortcomings of Jagger for the part was in wearing the armour. Initially, the production had been given permission to use the actual armour Ned Kelly wore at Glen Rowan to use in the battle sequences at the film's climax but Jagger was unable to even lift the iron headpiece, let alone carry around plate armour that weighed about as much as he did. Instead, a replica suit was crafted from tin, coated in fibreglass for reinforcement. As for the film itself, it isn't nearly as bad as people make it out to be, and as it retains at least the core of Jones' screenplay, it remains one of the most accurate depictions to date, which should tell you a lot about the competition. The structure is fairly sound, opening with a flash forward to Ned's last 24 hours, then cutting back to Ned returning from his stint in prison for receiving a stolen horse. This is perhaps the best place in fact to start a feature film about Ned, as it allows the story to focus on his honest years, and how he fell back into a life of crime before being outlawed. Much is made of Ned's horse stealing with George King, including a rather memorable scene with Ned participating in Hopstep Jump in the Rain as a way of bargaining with the Jewish stock purveyor Baumgarten over horse prices. The mood shifts from vibrant and fun to grim and ominous as the film progresses, and is punctuated by some fantastic music by Shel Silverstein and Waylon Jennings. The key moments in the story are accompanied by songs rather than a score, the farcical Euroa campaign using the song Blame It on the Kellys to liven up proceedings, for example. The game's up, Ned. Come quietly. I'm not Ned Kelly, sir. But I am. Anybody steals a horse, blame it on the Kellys. Of course, it would be criminal not to use Mick Jagger's singing in the film, and he doesn't disappoint with his rendition of The Wild Colonial Boy, while giving the constabulary the stink eye. Ned is again given a fictional love interest, complete with clandestine wedding on the eve of his execution. The gang members are almost non-existent throughout, dwarfed by the emphasis on Ned. The police are portrayed as being dogged in their determination to punish the Kelly family and bring Ned in dead or alive, but never as overtly good or evil. There are many facets of Ned that are put to the fore here that the 2003 film in particular dropped the ball on, such as Ned being literate and well-spoken, his often rocky relationship to his little brother Dan due to Dan not always towing the line, and his quick wit. One of the surprising elements that automatically puts this film above its millennial companion is that the characters wear hats. Not only was this expected at the time, it also enabled the Kelly sympathisers to create their visual shorthand of their support, a chin strap worn under the nose. The cinematography by Jerry Fisher, who worked on the film's Highlander and Yellowbeard among many others, is stunning and captures the atmosphere perfectly, and also features what was to become a staple of Ned Kelly film adaptations the eye slit POV shot. The mist creeping around Ned during The Last Stand in particular is fantastic, and captures the feel of the moment well. 
Watching the film now, it becomes apparent that the visuals hold up far better than many films contemporary to it. Unfortunately, the film's shortcomings are far more apparent. The casting is frequently off, and this is no more manifest than Jagger's valiant attempt to act with an Irish accent. It is unfortunately a case of having more enthusiasm than skill. Though Clarissa K. Mason is brilliant as Ellen Kelly, and Frank Thring is, in my opinion, the best on-screen depiction of Sir Edmund Barry to date. There's even a cameo from Kamal during the Euroa sequence of the film. The costumes, while obviously well made, are frequently subpar in terms of accuracy. For instance, putting Ned in a frilly shirt and tuxedo for his raid on the bank at Euroa, which is symptomatic of the larger problem regarding accuracy. While the script is accurate, the twigs made for dramatic effect tend to spoil what could have been otherwise the definitive on-screen telling of the tale. Seemingly small things like shifting Ned's last stand from the open fields next to the inn to a cunning on the railway, while beautifully dramatic, are also woefully inaccurate. Having the execution as the opener is somewhat of a bizarre choice. Obviously it was intended to be something akin and function to the opening chorus from a Greek tragedy or a piece of Shakespeare, but it never really feels like it fits with the rest of the tale as it's told. Perhaps this also comes from the fact that beyond it being a retelling of Ned's outlawry, there never seems to be much of a moral to the story. While far from the best adaptation of Ned Kelly's life to film, it is certainly a significant cut above its competition, which includes the 1950s Bob Chitty film The Glen Rowan Affair, and the 2003 Heath Ledger vehicle. It still manages to be an entertaining film in its own right, and shows that despite a lack of an acting background, Mick Jagger was still talented enough to hold his own, even when far out of his depth, perhaps allegorical with his interpretation of Ned in the film. This film is worth a watch if you're new to the story of Ned Kelly, but is by no means essential viewing. That honour goes to the miniseries The Last Outlaw that came ten years later. I would highly recommend this version of the story even to people with no specific interest in history, as it manages to be a fun and engaging depiction of the past with great music. This film gives me a lot of pleasure, despite its shortcomings. Yes, I'll meet you. There.